What's up everybody, this is Sigfig, and today we will be talking about the relationship between the Fourier transform and matrix multiplication. That's right, even though intuitively these two operations don't seem to have a connection, there is a deeper relationship to be explored here. And our motivation for trying to find out if there is a relationship here is that matrix multiplication is an operation that's very very easy for robots and computers to work with. And since the Fourier transform is such an important operation, if we can turn that into a matrix multiplication, that makes it very easy for computers to work with. Before we dive into this video, I hope you are comfortable with linear algebra and Fourier transforms. From the linear algebra side, you should understand comfortably what a vector is and how to do matrix multiplications. And from the Fourier transform side, I hope you understand that it is simply an operation that takes a signal in the time domain and transfers it into the frequency domain. So let's start with this very innocent looking function f of t equals t squared and let's say out of pure boredom we wanted to try and turn this into a vector. So maybe how we would do that is we for every component in the vector we take one value of f of t. So here, I have an infinitely long vector starting from f of negative infinity and going all the way to f of positive infinity. So a very theoretical, mysterious vector goes on for infinity, but it does contain the values of f of t equals t squared. And here we go by one time step as we go down the vector. So time is increasing as we go down the vector, but this time step of 1, it doesn't have to stay at 1, it could be 0.1, it could be 0 0.0001, and we could keep shrinking and shrinking and shrinking this vector until we get something so unimaginably small, infinitesimally small. And this infinitesimally small number is going to be represented with dt. Well, now that we can turn functions into vectors, we can do vectorish things to them. And of course, we can scale vectors, we can add them, but we can also take dot products between vectors. There's a lot of ways to represent the dot product. We can smack this big circle of the two functions. We can put these brackets around them. We can take the transpose of one of those vectors and matrix multiply with the other vector. Or if you want to be super, super explicit, you can write this big sigma sum notation. And all of these, they have a continuous counterpart. If, the con if our continuous function were not represented as a vector, you would write the dot product like this, taking the integral between the product of these two functions. You may realize that the form that this continuous dot product takes looks pretty similar to the Fourier transform. And that is a very good observation. This might get you thinking, does the Fourier transform have a deeper connection with the dot product that we usually associate with vector multiplication? So for now, I want to draw attention to this form of the dot product. So the dot product is very useful for taking the correlations between two vectors to measure how close together two vectors are. So if we want to see how much a function f correlates with the oscillation, then we can take f dot product with e to the i omega t, which is a pretty general oscillation. And for reasons that will be clear later, I want to swap these two. So I take the transpose of e to the i omega t and multiply it with the column vector f. So let's see what this looks like more explicitly. We have our row vector and we multiply it with our column vector. And for the sake of preserving space, I will take away the dt's. So it looks a lot less cluttered. Now, in our row vector, time is increasing as we go left to right, and in our column vector, time is increasing as we go from the top to the bottom. And you might be wondering why the exponent in the row vector keeps getting more and more negative as we continue on to the right. 
because as I just said, time is increasing. So why is it becoming more negative? And the reason for that is because whenever we take the transpose of a complex vector, we need to take the complex conjugate. If you do not take the complex conjugate, then the whole matrix multiplication falls apart. This complex conjugate is what you see in the Fourier transform, e to the negative i omega t. So if you've been wondering where that negative sign comes from, it comes from this rule. So if we set t equal to positive 1, we get e to the negative i omega 1. Now we know that the Fourier transform gives us a function that varies with frequency. So this matrix multiplication should give us a column vector that varies with frequency as we go from top to bottom, negative infinite frequency to positive infinite frequency, similar to the time vectors that I've been showing you for this video. So in order to get that, we need to realize that the oscillation e to the negative i omega t is a function of two variables, frequency and time. In order to express that, we can extend our row vector into a matrix that varies with frequency going top to bottom and varies with time going left to right. So the horizontal direction is associated with time and the vertical direction is associated with frequency. Let's call this matrix F. Now that we have explicitly written out more of the values, we can see that time increases as we go from left to right and frequency increases as we go from top to down. In the exponents, I have written the frequency values in blue and the time values in gold. Another very interesting observation of this matrix you might notice is that these two quadrants are sort of reflections of each other. They contain the same values. You can see in the corners that they have the same combination of infinities. The same applies for these other two quadrants. These symmetries indicate that F is a symmetric matrix, where F is equal to F transpose. This is a very important property to understand if you want to understand the fast Fourier transform, which is considered one of the most important algorithms of the 20th century, but is outside of the scope of this video. Now let's see what happens when we multiply this matrix by our column vector. Notice how at the end of this multiplication, we have a long list of dot products. So we have a column vector of dot products and each of these dot products changes as the frequency changes. And as we mentioned earlier in the video, all dot products have a continuous version, a continuous expression, which comes in the form of this integral. So the continuous version of this dot product looks like this column vector of integrals. Now we can simplify these expressions. If we turn the yellow vector on the left into a more compact form, we get this integral multiplying f by e to the negative i omega t. If we simplify the expression on the right, the blue vector, we get a matrix multiplication f times the vector f of t. If we write out the dimensions of this matrix multiplication, we will find that the red matrix F has dimensions omega by t, and the green column vector F of t will have dimensions t by 1. And per the rules of matrix multiplication, we put them together, and we get an omega by 1 column a vector. And in a sense, the time dimension cancels out. 
And there you have it, the Fourier transform as a matrix multiplication.